the seagulls. Follow Chora. It's because they think sardines will be thrown into the sea. Thank you very much. <laughs> Talking nonsense. So I talk, no, no, enough's enough. Why should I put up with that? Talking nonsense. So I talk, no, no, enough's enough. Why should I put up with that? Don't bite them. Double them. Don't bite them. Double them. <laughs> Monday club, we're back, we're all still feeling pretty champion, it is the absentee passenger from yesterday, Tim Tim, Jonathan Boyce, the man with the quiff, there's something about Jonathan, whatever you decide to call him, he is with us today, I know him as my brother, how are you son? Yeah, I'm not too bad, thanks, disappointed to have missed yesterday, but I'm revving to go today to make oh, up revving. for lost time. I like it, Jonathan. I like it. It's good to have that energy on a Monday. Just when the hangovers are beginning to disappear, we come back with some energy, some va va voom, some adrenaline, Jonathan. And that's what we like to inject on your Monday night. And we will be continuing to do this throughout the close season, Jonathan. And it's going to be a pretty long close season. We'll get to that in a wee moment. Now, before we start, as always, a big thank you to fanboyfootball.com for continuing the sponsorship to the end of this month of the channel. Remember, you've only got two weeks. 15 days and that'll be it you can order no more t-shirts so the 15 day countdown is on for Boise Bus merchandise if you so wish to indulge we'd be more than happy for you to do so um, obviously there's options Jonathan as well that I just think should be mandatory hit the like button hit the subscribe button it costs you nothing it's right up there in that that top that top corner just hit the like button. Oh, that your button's down there. But anyway, the, you know, we're advertising up the top right corner. Also, if you want to become a member, we are currently sitting in double figures for members right now, which is a massive help for the channel, particularly when we're not going to have a sponsor from next month going on. It's one net and a month. There's no special gimmicks to it. If you want to do it and you want to support the Boise Bus, it will help because we want the channel. Jonathan, when we're doing, you know, 21 shows a month, which is what we're averaging right now, which is an astonishing amount of time, really. You know, I, I do have a full-time job, do you know what I mean? I would like, at the very least, for the channel to be self-sufficient, do you know what I mean? So, it does help, but again, it's not a begging bowl thing, it's not a demand, it's not mandatory, it's not going to mean that your comments don't get brought up the same as everyone else's, it's all a fair, even, level, playing field, Jonathan, because that is how we roll, it's the all-inclusive bus, and right now... Jonathan, the wave of positivity just continues. I've got to be bush right now, Jonathan. Uh, because this team have just put a smile back on everyone of the green half of the city and Scotland. The green half of Scotland, we should say. Uh, back into a positive mindset, Jonathan. There's an excitement now. There's almost a dread that the season has came to an end because 
What are we going to do? There's no European qualifiers, which is normally a good thing. But in actual fact, we're going to miss this group of players, Jonathan, so much. It's almost a negative. Do you know what I mean? I'm almost dreading the fact of 76 days, I think it is, to our next football match. Can you comprehend going that long without this addictive, relentless winning machine in your life? Oh, no, it's going to be very difficult. I mean, as Ange Postecoglou was saying, <laughs> uh, after the game, we've embraced pretty much everything right then from him right through to his little woolly jumper. Uh, and, you know, his, uh, his football team as well. And uh, it's going to be very difficult over the close season. And I don't think we're really used to this either, Russell, now I come to think for having such a, a long break because normally we'd be expected to be playing qualifiers. It's not like a two-week break. It's like a little oh. Christmas Christmas week off or two and then you're right back in. <laughs> we're not used to a full summer holiday um, sort of thing. So this is, this is a bit uh, surreal um, for us to be in a position where we're not having to look over our shoulder and, and start looking at these these deadly Champions League qualifiers that have been our banana skin of so many years of late. Um, so certainly on that point of view, it's, it's a little bit more like, oh, well, we've only got friendlies to, to play in. I'm not even sure who we're playing in them yet, to be honest. I don't even know if they've been announced as of yet. Uh, so you're, you're really looking at a, a longer break now until the... Till the football really all begins again. Mm. Although I think it all starts a little bit sooner this year, doesn't it? Because the uh, the World Cup is on in December, so I think the league actually begins a little bit earlier this time around than it normally does. But yeah, yep. definitely disappointing, and that we're not going to have to wait now however long as two months. It just feels like a proper proper summer holiday. It's like a throwback to dare I say it, the Martin O'Neill years. I like you, Jonathan. Now that's very interesting. You know, the klaxon has went off after seven minutes. Martin O'Neill's name's been mentioned. But it's a wee bit frustrating you've done that, Jonathan, because as you know, before we got on a Monday, we don't pretend to be overly organised on the Boise buses, which I think is half the charm. But I do always send you the talking points, Jonathan, prior to going on, right, that I've managed to somehow come up with. Uh, usually on a hazy Monday afternoon. But, do you know the funniest thing was? The one I cropped the picture, right? And you can see I'm not typing right now. <laughs> My last talking point, which I had to say to you, was Martin O'Neill. That's it. That's the talking <laughs> point. Because <laughs> I knew you would laugh at that, but you beat me to it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought you'd laugh at that. So, ah, oh, you bastard. You beat me to it, <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> But yeah, speaking of... <laughs> uh, well done, though. Well played. I like that, mate. I like that. Now, Jonathan, I think talking about the break, obviously from fans, we're selfish little bastards. You know, the break could have been two years going into the close season last season. It wouldn't have bothered me. I was, if I'd never seen a football for a long, long time, it wouldn't have bothered me. I couldn't even get excited about Adidas releasing the new kits or anything. I didn't give a shit, to be honest with you. I just wanted football to go away. Such as my sort of um, just real loss of understanding as to what had happened at Celtic, getting more and more frustrated by the week by what they were doing next, how long the wait had went on for a manager, how much the fans and the board are at odds. But do you know what, Jonathan, now we're saying we're going to miss the team, but I think we need to just take stock a wee bit. It's been an emotionally draining season, Jonathan, I think, for the for the team. But Andrew's on record saying it, you know, he literally had to give it his all, mate. Do you know what I mean? He's literally never... He's, what did he say, son? Like, he never had a season where, you know, he, he, he or some... I can't really remember, but it was like when he'd given so much... I put so much into... I can't remember the exact quote. But it's he along those lines. And one, again, another similar phrase that's came from the bus before as well. I'm, I'm sure he's watching. He I'm does sure watch the bus. I'm sure he's in the back seats. But I don't... Back... I, I don't know if you've seen the interview on Sky, Saturday next to Martin O'Neill. Claxon, uh, and he says, well, do you know what, mate? I like to flip it. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> he literally said he like, like, so Martin O'Neill had said so, he goes, I like to flip it. And I was like, you're definitely watching it. Ange, Ange, you've no paid your ticket, mate. Fucking get back here. <laughs> He's on the bus. He's definitely on the bus, mate. Um, but I think it's been quite emotionally draining, though, for the fan base as well, Jonathan. We're put through the ringer. 12 months ago, the team has been assembled at short notice, a lot of them have played too many matches you could say, I know there's debate about the Japanese boys but for whatever reason they look jaded, well not Maeda but I don't think he'll ever look jaded but Hatati certainly did, Ud Idaguchi for whatever reason has been really slowly integrated in the team, again you could maybe put that down to 
his energy levels and training maybe not quite being yeah. there um, because it's been unusual. He's the only one that Ange's brought in that you know is an Ange signing that hasn't been given more minutes than what, they, what they've actually had. Um, I think this break is needed. I look at Callum McGregor's last sort of seven years, Jonathan, as a, as a regular in the first team and you're talking about two, three week breaks that are akin to, you know, an Easter holidays or a Christmas holidays for the school. Callum McGregor's been front, left and centre of that the whole seven years whilst playing as many minutes, if not every minute, of each season at Celtic. The guy's averaging 60 to 70 games. This wee break that we're going to have right now is essential. I'll give you another reason why it's essential, Jonathan. I think what they've all put into it, I want them all to reflect and enjoy it. I want it to become a bug, Jonathan, for these players. I want winning to go. I want them to see when they go back into that first day of training, they're raring to go again because of how they felt. You can only enjoy the moment if you have the time to reflect on it, Jonathan. Not constantly looking over your shoulder to go, oh, shit, we've got to now start thinking about qualifiers or travel to Kazakhstan in like three weeks, four weeks. You know, I think this is going to be wonderful that the players will be able to take a step, step back, reflect, acknowledge, embrace what they've done. And then, do you know what? That's when the addiction starts, Jonathan. That's, you know, you know, you, know, you get serial winners in life. That's going to help them become serial winners. Um... I also believe with the break as well, and I'm on record saying this, you know, many a time already. I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I'm sure you'll agree. Ange does his best work on the training ground. That's literally his where he, his favourite place to be. A full pre season with that squad. If they do their transfer deals early, um, whilst the players are off, and then he's got, you know, the majority of them, sixty to seventy percent of his incomings done and dusted for day one of pre season. That's a mouth watering pros uh, prospect. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think that definitely will benefit us having Postecoglou being able to work with his own players this summer as well. Let's bear that in mind. He's now getting a lot more time with his own squad that he's put together, a team that he has now proven can go the distance, can hang in a title race, can win a league championship. Um, you know, and we're, we're very close to actually producing the unthinkable and doing a treble. You know, they weren't they weren't far away from it, um, which is just unbelievable when you think of back to where we were. You know, twelve months ago, and we all couldn't wait for the season to finish. This season, we just don't want it to stop at all. It's just unbelievable um, how much of a how much of an impact one man has really had on the whole squad and, and everything else around it. But certainly going back to the point in terms of, uh, you know, this break that we're going to get, it's going to be a big benefit, particularly not just for your likes of Callum McGregor, because see, if you were Callum McGregor, you would never know he only gets two or three weeks break. He's somehow, he's a machine in that sense. He just, he just seems to keep going and going. I don't know, he could give the Duracell bunny a run for his money, I think. Callum <laughs> McGregor. <laughs> he's got that much energy about him. No, either. <laughs> yeah, and that might you know. <laughs> but um, you know, it definitely will help. Uh, particularly the one I look at is uh, Rio Atati. I think he's been badly needed um, a bit of a rest, and he's been similar to McGregor as well over the last year or so, where he's pretty much been non-stop playing, not had really a significant break at all. Just finished up in the J League, and then he ends up right in the middle of a title race with Celtic, and you know he hits the ground running. But you could tell. I uh, feel towards the end of this campaign, he was beginning to tire and it was shown in his performances that he could have done with, uh, I think, a little bit more time on the bench. But hopefully now that he'll get that opportunity to, to fully rest up over the next couple of months, players like him will come on leaps and bounds and we'll see a much better version of him uh, in the next season, which I think we absolutely will. Uh, and, you know, as, as well as that, you're also looking at transfer business. Celtic have got another few Big, big transfer signings to make as far as I'm concerned in, uh, in mm. this window. Signs are already looking promising. We're already linked with a left back, uh, Iranian left back, I believe, as well for a couple of million pounds, which is nice and sharp business again. Hopefully it's a sign that's going to be similar to what we did in January. Get yep. them in early. Part of a new sort of um, development for the club, I think. They seem to be learning their lessons from previous transfer windows. And yep. the quicker you can get them in, particularly this season now, because they know... They've got the Champions League money. There's absolutely no reason for Celtic to be hanging about, waiting till the last minute and dragging their heels. The fact they know they've got that Champions League money there means they've actually got a, you know, a free pass for the whole of this transfer window to try and you know actually get the players that Ange Postecoglou and whoever else is helping them in that matter and get them in. You know, whoever he's identified as targets, you get them brought in yeah. you know, as quickly as you possibly can. So I think in that sense, if you're looking at this break, it couldn't have came at a better time for Celtic. And 
you know, if you're going back to it, as I say, I think uh, you had it on the double down uh, quiz with Daniel. I think it was 2008, the last time I think you'd mentioned, was the last time Celtic hadn't played uh, qualifiers. Qu- question Rangers. number two as well. Question number two. Difficult question number two, that, by the way. That was a wee bit yeah, hard I know. You did yeah, throw no. Danielle under the bus a wee bit with that one. <laughs> it's the only way she could learn, mate. The only way she could learn. Threw, threw her under the bus and just <laughs> read on at full speed. Didn't even, didn't even slow down for her. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, 2008. So it's, it, it just goes to show you. And I think, you know, when you look back at teams like uh, Martin O'Neill's, I know I mentioned him again. <laughs> I feel like we're part of the Martin O'Neill fan club. Why don't we just get him oh, back? I definitely am. I definitely am. <laughs> Enter a football, Martin. Come on down. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's like Martin O'Neill's and uh, Gordon Strachan's era. Um, you know, a particular fond memories of Celtic, they have done well. Uh, in Europe and both of those managers' tenures. And I think a large part of that was down to the fact that they were getting that, that break in the summer where they could really implement their own ideas, philosophies, get the tra- uh, transfer business done nice and sharp, and then they've got that, that time to actually bed the players in. Um, so I think, would you would you probably agree that we're probably looking at this now and thinking with Postacoglu, he now has a tremendous opportunity to make his own impact on the European stage given the fact he's going to have this extra time to work with the players and indeed do his transfer business. No, I think this is what he wanted the whole time. I don't think he joined Celtic, Jonathan, to to boast about catching 55 or fucking however many it is they want to call it. I genuinely think, I don't think he cares about Celtic it being our 52nd title. I didn't see a 52 sign anywhere yet, so no one cares about that stuff. For me, when you get to that number, that many, that many Scottish Cups, that many League Cups, it's about going... But what do we not do enough of? And I think Andrew's going to focus his attention on there, Jonathan. We're going to come to that in a wee minute. Huge thank you to Chunks of My Chunks. Now, he doesn't think it's a joint avenue. It's not. But it should be in that section. There's like a monthly membership. It's like one ninety nine a month. It's not important that you do it, by the way. It's it's there. But I thank you very much for doing that, mate. And a huge thank it's you fun. to Nacho Novo's Fingers and Dado Perso as well. <laughs> who randomly <laughs> get thrown in at the end of that message. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that's coming from. But Jonathan, I think it's very important that we look at what Angie's main focus next year is going to be. Because the league is always a priority, right? But for me, I know a lot of fans now, and I, think, I do think there's a generational element to this, where they've seen that many trebles now that they think, oh, well, no, trebles come first. For me, it's the league title comes first, right? The league title comes first. And then it's Europe. And then the two cups. Scottish Cup predominantly, League Cup, meh. Right? It's great to have won it because it's it sets the tone maybe at the start of the season. It's a good visual to see the team lifting the first trophy of the campaign. I get its importance from that aspect. But realistically, it's a four game tournament for Celtic that or three game is four game tournament, four, right? four game tournament yeah. for Celtic to win that we've won countless times. I think Ange Postecoglou join Celtic to make impacts elsewhere. I think next season you'll know bread and butter is the league. I don't see the treble as being an essential thing next year. If we got papped out of both cups, my my, my big issue is the mindset, Jonathan, that not only the Celtic players need to move away from, but I think a fan base needs to kind of modernise a wee bit as well. Stop focusing on just being better than than the other lot, right? And, and, and boasting about stuff. For me, it's about Europe. And I want to see Celtic fulfil its potential as a club, Jonathan. Whilst we've got a manager there who I think is capable of at least getting us a hell of a long way down that road. Celtic's a huge football club, Jonathan. Celtic have a bigger stadium than an Ajax, for example, who weren't even that long ago in Champions League semi-finals and were literally a minute away from being in the final. They were in a Europa League final against Man United only four years ago as well. Yeah. That, you know, we we should be able to look at these sort of clubs, Jonathan, and learn from them and be, an, be as ambitious as them. I think we've got a manager, Jonathan, who wants to be that sort of size. At least, right? And that's where it starts, though, anyway. Do you know what I mean? I'm not going to get overly carried away and say, oh, I will be taking on Real Madrid. You know what I mean? Beating them in semi-finals and stuff. I'm not saying that. But I want to make a dent in Europe, Jonathan. I want us to start becoming a European force again. And I think Angie's focus next year, Jonathan, will be... Firstly, the league title. Secondly, the Champions League. The treble is a bonus. 
That's my opinion. And I certainly hope we can all come round to that way of thinking. Because I think then you'll see more trebles if we're making impacts in Europe, Jonathan, and getting further into Europe's Premier competition. They'll become easier to win. But we also need to be very conscious as well that the competition domestically is getting stronger, whether we like to admit it or not. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think certainly you've got to look across the city and realise that the competition has been there, which makes this achievement for us even more impressive. Uh, you know, if you ask me, regardless of what happens for them on, on Wednesday night, South Carolina, either beating a team that's got a Europa League final or they're beating Europa League winners in their own backyard over a 38-game no, exactly. season. So I think that has to be a hats off to Foster Coglu for a, a, an unbelievable job and it really just highlights the magnitude of the job um, he's done you know, there as, as well. But if you're going back to the sort of initial point in terms of European football and the importance of European football, it's massive for Celtic. It's been such a long time since we've really won, uh, we, we really made any inroads in a European competition whatsoever. I mean, you're going back to Henry Glass's days since the last time Celtic won a knockout game in Europe after Christmas. It's, uh, it's quite a remarkable statistic when you look back at it. I was only about 11 or 12 years old the last time Celtic actually managed to win a game after Christmas in Europe. Um, yeah. you, you, you look at it and you just think, there's there's another reason. I'm going to bring his name up again. Martin O'Neill. I, like <laughs> I feel like I have now just got on the Martin O'Neill bandwagon, but it's because you've mentioned, you mentioned the cup. There's a point to this. It's not like I was just bring him up. But Martin O'Neill... <laughs> Martin O'Neill used to always in the League Cup, I remember... He used to play his kids in his reserves. I can't remember. I'm sure you'll remember. You know the whole squad inside. Oh, yeah. you know, and, play... and what year they were all born. And what yeah, squad the... number they all were. He used to play, <laughs> if you remember, as I'm sure you do, you'll remember he used to play Jamie Smith and guys like Kearney or whatever else in like League Cup ties. Um, and he would save his better players for the league and for Europe, whatever Absolutely. European Cup was in. Um, and it would be interesting because it's been a long, long time since Celtic have actually done that with the League Cup. I mean, that's why I went back to Martin O'Neill, because I can't really remember uh, any recent manager doing it. I mean, maybe Strachan did it when he was in charge. I can't really remember Strachan doing that much, though, either. Uh, it seems like the League Cup's almost gained more importance as the years have gone on, as if Celtic have almost chucked the towel in in Europe and they're just concentrating on domestic trophies. <laughs> well, that's a very good point, Paul. Yes, we are We are getting a commission off Martin O'Neill, by the way. <laughs> Every time Absolutely. you mention Martin O'Neill, an extra 10 pence lands in the boys' <laughs> pass tell. <laughs> but, you know, if you're looking at it, um, it's just a case that there has to be a, a, an incentive there. There has to be motivation from the Celtic board now to look at Europe and think, yes, we can actually make an impact in this. Yep. You, there's there's no reason why they can't. You know, you just have to look at how things have gone the league this season. And as I say, whether you like them or not, and nobody really likes them, let's be honest, but whether you like what they've done or not in terms of getting to a Europa League final, whether you think they're lucky, whether you think they won, you know, Rangers are playing in the Europa League final on Wednesday night and Celtic have beaten them in the league, which proves that they've beaten a team which have proven to be capable in Europe. So the dots are all there for Celtic to go ahead and join them up and work out how they get results in Europe. Because if they can do it at home against a team that are making progress in Europe, why is there um, such a... I don't even know what it is. It's like almost like a, a timidness with Celtic in terms of just not really feeling they can compete at mm. European level. I don't know what it is. There's almost a defeatist attitude at times, certainly totally over the agree. last number of years, um, amongst not just the, the board. I think fans have been guilty of it as well. I know. Myself, sometimes I've looked at it and just like, ah, nah, no chance. No, no way. <laughs> Absolutely, is Jay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Good batter for Jay Lee there. I like that, mate. Uh-huh. Uh, but, but, Jonathan, let's talk about the European stuff because I think you raise good points there. I'm going to expand on it a wee bit and get your thoughts. And this is going to be sort of a, an accumulation of maybe wee facts and figures that I've been sort of, sort of, a uh, projecting on the show over the last sort of couple of months. Let's try and put them all together here. So last night I was saying, you know, this is a damning indictment. This is the first damning indictment on the board. We had less qualifiers at the beginning of nine in a row than what we had at the end of nine in a row. How does that work in any way, way shape, or form? You've had nine cracks at the Champions League qualifiers. And when you began, you had two. I think it was Helsinki and then Helsingborg under Mr. Neil Lennon. And yes. by the end, you were having to navigate three. 
And during that nine, I think there was four at one point we had to do one of the seasons. This is silly. This is not called progress, Jonathan. Now, whether we like it or not, the other mob that are in the final right now of the Europa League, since they've been competitive in Europe, okay, in fact, you know what? They were in Europe. Fuck it. They got beat off a team for Luxembourg. We'll laugh at that bit first, right? <laughs> now, but then after that, what they've done is break the coefficient enough, alongside Celtic, may I add, but Celtic haven't made the same dense Rangers, have in my opinion. Um, and without the same resources, the other lot haven't had the same resources, let's be honest. I know they've spunk loads and debt and stuff like that, but in terms of like fees on the pitch and that, I, I, I don't think they've... But anyway, they, they have basically, Jonathan, achieved a final and last year made a huge contribution, huge contribution to us being getting, by winning the league, automatic qualification to the group stage. So that's a couple of things already. That shows you we went from two qualifiers to three qualifiers nine years apart. We only qualified three times in that time. The reason the coefficients boosted so much is because another team for Scotland has been competitive in Europe and it's actually going to go even further due to them making a final. We went out to a team for Norway on, I don't know, Jonathan, let's be honest, a tenth of the wages, tenth of Celtic's wage bill. Bodo Glimp, whether we know they're a good team or not, by Dubai. I'll tell you why it's by Dubai. Because here's now point number three. Why have we been told, and it's been accepted for so long, Celtic's financial disparity with the top clubs in Europe is why we've not been able to achieve. So I'm going to make my next point. I watched us under Gordon Strachan. I didn't like Gordon Strachan when he was in charge at the time. History's been very kind to him. Three in a row. Martin O'Neill didn't even win three in a row. Hey. Um... <laughs> he made he made the last sixteen of the Champions League twice, Jonathan, with guys like Paul Telford and his team the first year. <laughs> Manus and Caldwell were his centre back partnerships both times. Paul Hartley, Barry Robson were his BFL players. We were playing against Barcelona with these guys. We were playing against AC Milan, Jonathan, with these guys. Don't tell me that those teams are Ronaldinho's and with guys like Pirlo, etc. Well as far <laughs> Kaka weren't as far apart as what that Celtic team is that, that that like then than what it is now. It's just they get inflated wages now. The actual golf and you know, the marketplace and stuff like that is is the exact same. I think it's been a lazy excuse to which again, whether we like it or not, the other lot have proven Jonathan, they made a mockery of that argument. And it's time Celtic buck up their ideas in Europe. And I'll give you this is now number five. See if you want to hang on to an elite manager. And I think we're all now getting into a territory where we're looking at Ange Postecoglou and beginning to think, for everything he brings to the table, he may well be, Jonathan, an elite manager. See if we want to hang on to elite managers, Jonathan. I want to hang on to our best, best players. And I think in the likes of Kyogo, Jack and Marquez, we'll talk about them in a bit. But I think we need to start thinking, well, our vision needs to match the elite players or manager at the club, Jonathan. Otherwise, you'll lose them all and you'll be back to square one, and use the example from your rivals, rather than a stick to beat them with, that they're, you know, and I like having a laugh, you know, obviously we're going to slag them, Jonathan, with Ian Durant, who's, you know, videoed in kebab shops saying F the Pope and stuff like that, when he's telling you a lot to behave, <laughs> of course we're going to laugh at that, it's embarrassing, when Graham <laughs> Sooners is sitting there, he's not even going to the game, telling you all to behave, of course we can laugh at that, but in the footballing sense, Actually, I just it whets my appetite in a way and it frustrates me that we've not been able to do that. I think they've made a mockery of all the excuses that have been used for the past decade. And just before I come to that, a huge thank you to Kaiser HTTC, who's became the latest YouTube member. Yes. But Jonathan, I take it away from what I've said there. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly something to, to you know consider with what Rangers have been able to do. And, uh, you know, going back to Martin Neal, <laughs> he, he came in and he said Rangers were the benchmark uh, domestically when he first came in because Rangers were in the league by miles at that time um, whereas now I think you've got to look at it I think Rangers have proven themselves to be a bit more of the benchmark um, in Europe over the last uh, few years anyway um, as much as that's painful to admit from a Celtic point of view I don't think Celtic have um, done themselves justice at all um, in Europe over the last few years and yes I think we're all guilty of it we look at how uh, how much money is getting spent in football now? Crazy amounts of money getting spent in the top leagues. Absolute madness. The amount of money that gets put about 
on a, a lot of it's just on absolute diddies, by the way, and you look at it, and I'll yep. give you a point in case, look at Manchester United, it's been, like, you know, Man United, one of the biggest clubs, you know, in the world, and, yep. you know, they spend tons of money on players, but, you know, look look at how well they're doing, and how, how they've been run for the last four or five, six years, you're probably all the way back to when Ferguson left them, um, in terms of that, so it's, it's one of those ones where you can't really look at it too much as well these guys are getting inflated wages so that means they must be a bit you know as much better than us as how much they're getting paid so you know if they're getting paid six times our wage and they must be six times the player that's not how that it became that's, the narrative jonathan that, that is what became the narrative that's exactly how it's uh how it's been kind of turned into defeatist attitude um over a number of years and i think everyone's been the kind of same on You're that bang on the money. fans right through to the board, through to through to the players, through to the coaches, I think, um, have all kind of bought into that. But then if you use the Man United argument again, Man United are far more money than, than most of those clubs um, in England. But then, you know, the season they're having, they're sitting, what, seventh, eighth in the Premiership? So, uh, yep. you know, it's a case that they are not being feared by anyone anymore. The English Premiership clubs don't fear Manchester United. And, the, the, the moral of that story is really the fact that Celtic, I think, have been going into these games with far too much fear and not enough belief that they're actually going to be able to get the results done um, in this. Because, I mean, what was it? I mean, even you're looking at the last seven in the Champions League group stage, just with all 2013 something. Actually, I don't know if we got with Rogers. Um, but the last time we got out of the groups is about 2013 or, or so when uh, Lennon was in charge. Um, and even then, after he got out of the groups, you think he's going to get back the next season, and he ends up in an even worse position. Exactly. As Campbell Pass, I think it was at Shakhtar Karagandhi, I think, the season after that, where James Forrest scores in the last minute. Or was oh, that I remember season? that. No, no, think... that was. That was the next season. Yeah, that was the next yep. season. Because that was when they, they broke the hoops with the strip. Oh, he Remember, that. it was all that. I hated that. Yeah. I actually <laughs> bought it. I it's bought terrible. it. And it, it was like pyjamas, man. I fuck it. I was like, what is this shite? I only bought it to be all. You know, sell it daft and all that shite. Hated the whole you know, thing. Like, the Colgate toothpaste you get, the green and white Colgate toothpaste, that's what I always Total! Like. <laughs> <laughs> Colgate Total toothpaste, here we are. May as well have been sponsored by those bastards. That was terrible. <laughs> but, uh, Terry Rob's a member, Jonathan. Oh, yes. Now, right? oh, fine. And, oh, thank oh, you so much. Members, well, well, thanks for Terry. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, going back to you, you know, you look at that, Neil Lennon did get them to the last 16 of the Champions League. Tremendous achievement. He did that with a bloody terrible team as well, by the way. I mean, he had, he, uh, he had was it Effie Ambrose playing centre-half then and Kelvin Wilson, I think. Kelvin Wilson, a free, a free transfer. Kelvin Wilson, was he not? Yeah, and Effie Ambrose, who, let's say, you know, fair enough, he did actually start quite well. He just, career. Kevin, Effie Ambrose just sold the jerseys for Dunfermline and they uh, got relegated to League One. Uh, exactly. You, you see exactly what you're dealing with. And they are not obviously then had a sprinkling of quality similar to Strachan's team, but there was plenty of bang average uh, players in there. And then you know you're looking at it the next season, you think, well, you get to the last sixteen, this is now a chance for the board to kick on. And what they end up doing is they end up just going right backwards and end up just not having as much fun with it. Holy Moses! Wow. Feed the bear. I don't know if you've done that by accident, big boy. Um. That I, yeah. I really, I, I am very concerned that you've put a fiver in, mate. <laughs> you've maybe added an extra zero there. Aye, right, we'll sort that out. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think. I that's mean, obviously, it. thank you for the donation. Yeah, of course. But I don't. I, I'm positive. I'll get the YouTube money. It'll come in in the next month or so, right? So once I get it in and get the other 45 to you, mate. I'll, get, I'll just give it when I get paid. I'll give you 45 quid on payday, mate. And I'm guessing that was meant to be a five and he's fucking hit 50. Uh, you mad. Hit an extra zero. The bus only goes for an hour. We're not actually going to Australia. Uh, <laughs> I know. How much are charging these people for a ticket, Russell? <laughs> I know. No, I... I, I this is like Scott Rail prices. This is ridiculous. You'll be teaching us to the boys train soon enough. Oh, no, we can't say train. Can I use that one? Can't, can't, can't use the that train. One. I mean, if Feed's been just like the most generous man in Europe, then, well, you know, my mind's blown by that. Absolutely blown. But if there is a mistake there, don't worry. We'll sort it because I'm like that. I would never, you know, I'm not going to take advantage of it if it's a mistake. What a man. Oh, look at that. No, mate, that's my donation. 
because I can't, can't buy t-shirts in my size. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, that. That's too, just too cool feed. That means the world to me, mate. You're going to bring a tear to my eye. Cheers to you, my friend. I don't know if he's noticed. I'm drinking Stella out of a green and white can tonight, Jonathan, because genuinely I seen them green and white on the shelf, right? And I was meant to be off it tonight and that. And I was like, do you know what I'll do? Because they're green and white cans. I thought they were alcohol free. I was like, I'll just buy them because, you know, what a nice cool gimmick it'll look. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I got to the counter, she was like six ninety nine for like six stumpies. I was like, hey, the nerve, why is it so much? Lifted up the pack. <laughs> They're stronger than normal Stellas. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I think I, I know. I know. She was like, "Are you sure you still want them?" I'm like, "I absolutely am sure." Now it's actually worked out. I've, you know, I was secretly delighted. Feed the bear, mate. I don't know what to say about that, pal. I just an incredible gesture. You know, you've just covered basically. You know, a month and a bit subscription fees for the bus single handedly. That's just incredible mate generosity I, I i cannot thank you enough thank you so much uh, i don't want to turn all cheesy about it and all that either we're here to entertain and jonathan we're here to talk celtic and we'll get back to talking celtic but a massive thank you feed the bear and you can see the respect flying in from everyone in the comments as well feed so generous as normal what a man i've known feed the bear now jonathan for uh, way over a year um from a regular comment on the, the old Screamer, whatever it was called, show. Steamer tra Screamer, Screamer Trainer. <laughs> uh, uh, definitely be named it yeah, I, I won't be allowed to say it. But um, I think uh, Feed the Bear and me always got on very well in the comments. I think he, always, he liked my approach, Jonathan, shall we say. Uh, so what a brilliant thing to do. Who will Boise bring in with the Feed the Bear transfer funds, Jonathan? And this leads us on nicely because... We're also talking about, Jonathan, the the ambition for Europe and stuff like that with me. I think it's very easy to then go, give him a war chest, give him £40 million, Jonathan, and let's all party with it. It, it, it is really, really not about that for me, Jonathan. Yep. What this is about for me, right, is get Ange what he wants. Ange Postacoglu has now proven, oh, for fuck's sake, now Les Watts, mate. This is crazy. Oh, it means the world, man. Honestly, thank you so, so much. Um, £5 for Les Watts. That's so kind, mate. You're already a member. Yeah. £1.99 a month's more than enough, mate. Honestly, I'm not here to try to rip the piss out of anyone. £1.99 a month's all good. You were already doing that, Les. That's perfect. But thank you. And thank you for the bottom of my heart, mate. But aye, Jonathan, I think it's very interesting. What we need to do is Ange Postecoglou, we've learned this season, lives in the real world. He knows what Celtic's expectations are. He knows what Celtic's limitations are. I think we've seen that with his transfer policy. He knew there was uh, blue chip bargains in that J-League that could make an impact in Scotland. And he knew that fit a model for a team that hasn't competed in the top tier of European football, Jonathan, in five seasons by then, four seasons. Um, you know, 2017-18 was the last year we were in there. So he'll know revenues dropped. You know, we turned over £100 million pounds twice under Rogers. Yes, the operating costs went up, Jonathan. I've run a business for six years. My operating costs went up when my turnover went up and my profits yeah. went up, Jonathan. This is how it works. This is business. Your, your operating costs are meant to go up if you just keep, if you keep investing in it, you keep seeing a return That's for it. it. It's so basic. It's so basic. Now... Ange lived within Celtic's parameters this year and achieved the 40 million jackpot, as we were all calling it at the start of the season. He's achieved that. I don't think this necessarily means that we need to start going, give him 40 million pounds. No. Because I believe, Jonathan, his list of targets are going to be within the next level up parameters of Celtic. Ange lives in the real world. He absolutely is not sitting there, Jonathan, going, I need a war chest, I need this. He's going, no, 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 I need those five fucking players and they should all be affordable. Now the big key difference that we're going to find out, Jonathan. Yes, Sean the Mac, another new member. What a night, wow. mate. This is crazy. Thank you so much. Um, but yes, Jonathan, 
I think it's so important now that what we do is go, well, there's five realistic targets. Don't fuck about, Jonathan. Don't John McGinn them. Go and get them. Go and get them and back the manager because he's not, Angie's not the guy who's going to be going, well, we need to be targeting players that he knows are out with the control. There might be a, a couple of bold, ambitious signings on there, but Angie's too savvy, mate. He'll know deep down when he even uh, positions them to the Celtic board that deep down I know that that's within our financial capability. And that's where you know it because he's too clever. It's now time this board back the big man, Jonathan, is it not? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think he's he's proven himself. They've given him that year where it could have... Take easy tough. chunks. It was always going to be a little bit um, of a gamble and they appointed him in some ways, but at the same time, financially, they probably looked at it and knew he wasn't going to be um, commanding as much money because he had to earn his reputation a little bit. He's now done that and some with what he's produced on the park this season. And I think, you know, if you're looking at it in a bit more detail, the fact of the matter is, Foster Coglu's signings, pretty much every single one of them have uh, have made an impact. There's only a, a couple you could maybe argue haven't really had much of an impact. But then again, it's probably just because they haven't had a lot of game time in some of them. And I'm not including some of the signings, which I think were forced on them, like a James McCarthy, for example. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Ben. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those ones you're, you're looking at and you just think with uh, the board, it feels like there has been a change with them this season. They yeah. have been in the business done a bit yes. sooner. Long may it continue, I say. I'm hoping it doesn't turn out to be a, a sort of brief period where they just so we need to do this to get back on top because previously we have had a reactionary board rather than a proactive board, in my opinion. We've never really been on the front foot when we could have been on the front foot and we tend to wait until things uh, till shit hits the fan and then we're like, oh, fuck, we need to actually react and actually do something here. Whereas this time around, we've actually got ourselves into a position where we know we're playing Champions League group stages for the first time since 2008 in May. And, and we've now got these three months to go ahead and, and, and do whatever business Postacoglu wants done. And as far as I'm concerned, Postacoglu isn't going to be looking at massive wholesale changes now. The big rebuild's already been done uh, in the past season in terms of the number 100%. of players getting brought in. Now, he's, of course, he's going to look at getting rid of some dead wood. There's plenty of that to, to try and clear off the decks, which I would imagine he's going to be quite keen to, to move off the wage bill, if nothing else. And they don't seem to have a future. I think Christopher Julian, having said, I thought he might have been able to get back into the team earlier on this season. I'm convinced he's actually going to be one of the ones to he's go gone. now. Oh, it's gone. I think so. I think you can kind of tell from his attitude uh, walking around the pitch after the game. He kind of knows the, the game's up for him at Celtic Park, I think. Um, so, you know, there's obviously going to be a potential bit of money coming in there. I think Foster Coglu is really going to be looking at, obviously, Carter Vickers and Jota, non-negotiables, they need to be signed up permanently. I think he'll obviously want them both done. And then on yes. top of that, he's going to be looking at probably, maybe only about another three, four signings, um, I think, which, you know, he could, he could then potentially turn around and say, you know, I want six, seven million pounds on each of these players. And again, it's not, as we've said before, an, it's not an awful lot of money. Um, to be spending uh, on an individual player six, seven million pounds now. Uh, and I would think if those options became available, then they would have to back him and they'd have to go for him because the last thing we need is a John McGinn situation happening again with another top quality manager and you piss the guy off because I think Posta Coglu has now proven himself and I think Posta Coglu is the kind of man who will stand up for himself quite heavily uh, in the board if they started turning around and try and put demands and constraints on him when it came to the transfer window because he has now proven himself. His name is now in the top window, whether we like it or not. Uh, not that I think he'll be going anywhere uh, anytime soon, or I certainly hope not. But if you ended up putting him into a position where he's not getting the players he wants and he ends up unhappy, for me, with the job he's done at Celtic this season, he has another good season next season. Premiership clubs will be sniffing around him and we'd be absolutely foolish to give him any incentive to be leaving. Correct. Brilliant point, Jonathan. And a huge thank you as well, Ben Costello, um, with a 4 99 super sticker, mate. Honestly, like 4 99 euros, which I love. Good to see euros there. Uh, 
I, for the thank you very much. <laughs> but I want to bring up I want to bring up Monty's point. Monty, regular viewer, legend of a guy, likes a wee stir of the pot too on the other lot, I think. So <laughs> me and Monty have always got on pretty well when he winds them up. Uh, so I hear anyway, so I hear. Uh, all new signings must be top draw, first team ready to go and fit. Too many players brought in to sell to go aren't good to go, that has to change. I think he's got a point there about the injury side of it as well, Jonathan. Um, sometimes that can't be helped. But I don't want any more project players, Jonathan. And I think there's been a risk and reward approach with the J-League signings. I actually think, unfairly, Andrew's on a hell of a lot of pressure to you know, ingrain them almost himself. I actually think it was a wee bit unfair, Jonathan, if I'm honest, that had Kyogo, human being, Jonathan... Took a while to settle into Glasgow. That should have came as zero surprise, right? Zero. Zilch. No surprise yeah. at all. Instead, Ange almost had to count on someone like him hitting the ground running the way he did. Such was the devastation of the the squad. That, you know, the, the three of the key players of the the very successful year, Ayer, Christie, Edward, all go. Um, this time round. He's in a position of strength for so many reasons, Jonathan. Yeah, you got me as manager. You didn't want me first choice. You brought me in uh, without a head of recruitment, without any coaches. I never cried about it. I never whimpered. I never moaned. What I did was get on my business. I have told you before, Jonathan, a part of me thinks Ange enjoyed being in control of his own destiny. 100%. Okay? <laughs> the M- Mark Lawwell then comes in a City Group employee joins Ange Postacoglu whether we like it or not as part of the City Group Jonathan you're talking about advancing eyes maybe interested eyes from down south that for me there already is when you're prominent in the City Group Jonathan uh, and that's only been now amplified by the fact that he's, he's won a league title after being you know Celtic with 25 points behind a vibrant squad in the manner he has and the fact he's done it all his own Andrew's already an asset Jonathan okay that could be viewed as a potential appointment by other clubs now don't give him that choice back him back him Jonathan and like I say I don't think anything Andrew's going to put towards the board is going to be based on fees like you're saying you know about oh well because they're six to seven million if that's what one or two of them cost fine but i think overall if he's got five main targets he'll make sure those five main targets fall with what in his mind should fit within the financial parameters of the club so go do your job fellas and go fucking get them and remember what, what the position you left me in this time last summer i'm now tell i'm giving you these this list from a position of strength not from a position of desperation where we were last year and you're bringing me other players in but we'll move on 6-0 Jonathan was a swashbuckling display I was having a laugh with Terry Robb uh, on the on the Sunday series yesterday because he was talking about he liked the bookmarking of the season you know the Hearts defeat to the Hearts win you know and I like that 6-0 mm. I found was a fitting scoreline Jonathan because 6-0 takes me back to the the early days of the season we had a couple of 6-0 wins Dundee and was it Ross County Fuck Rose. Ross, uh, Dundee, anyway, were definitely one. It might be St Johnston, actually. I can't remember. Uh, but at the start of the season, it was kind of during a period where we were still a wee bit of form. was a bit patchy, Jonathan. And we did two 6-0 wins then. And then he finishes off this season going back to those days with a swashbuckling display. Surely we could look at putting the double figures past the team. If we start, Jonathan, the two guys who got a double at the weekend, and that is Kyogo, who's one of hearts... He's won our hearts permanently with his dancing, with his infectious smile, <laughs> with his high fives to all the players and they, they go down the tunnel. Even when he's injured, he wants involved, he wants to pat people's heads. He's just a lovely... At one point in this season, I think it was Ralph Snow was down with cramp and he was rubbing his leg, Jonathan. Oh, shit. He was rubbing his leg, Jonathan, to try and help him. He was a physio at one point. Uh, he's won the hearts and minds, but chaos, Jack and Marcus, Jonathan... That turns out we've seen the definition 
of why we call him Chaos at the weekend. The guy who loves an attempt at an overhead kick and it pulls off. He's been on the part three minutes. Boom! Overhead kick. Then his next goal, he takes a big swipe at it, misses it, it comes off his knee and he toe pokes it home for two yards, Jonathan. Runs away like he's scored, you know. The Champions League winning, you know, fight winning goal in the final. Right? That's because it means that much to him. Jonathan, what it did though mean was he finishes the season top scorer of his domestic Premier League for the second year in a row in a different country this time though. Jonathan, start them together. And I'm telling you, next year, the 10 goal, 10 goals that I'm desperate to see Celtic score at home becomes... Such a distinct possibility, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it certainly, it certainly would wet the appetite seeing the two of them together. I actually remember the first time you made that statement was actually after the uh, the Dundee game a year ago mm-hmm. uh, or so on the uh, the old podcast you used to do. And I remember thinking at the time, I was like, yeah, I could actually have seen that even before chaos was even in the mix. To be honest with the way Celtic were playing football, you add chaos into the mix now, and let's bear in mind it's a fully fit chaos Jackamacus that is now playing for Celtic, unlike the the version we got in the first half of the season that's just finished for us. You know, you're looking at a guy who is raring to go, and he managed to become the top goal scorer in half of a season, Russell, really. He didn't really feature that much at all um, before January. In fact, he missed a penalty at a game we were at in the first half of the season or he would have been the uh, the top goal scorer on his own because I think he tied with Charles Cook, didn't he, um, for the top goal scorer award. So, That's uh, you know, scores scores that penalty at the game we were at against Livingston and he's actually got it on his, on his own, which is incredible when you consider uh, how much of the first half of that season he missed and, you know, how much we were. Uh, there was, you know, there was genuine concern amongst a lot of Celtic fans, you know, when Kyogo gets injured and Jack Amakis ends up having to step up. Um, obviously, I was on the bus. We were, we were quite supportive of him from day one. It's always nice to see see him doing well from that point of view. But when you look at the two of them, and they've both been both been excellent. You know, Kyogo's goals outstanding. Uh, you know, at the weekend. You've got to look at it. His first one, he's, he's not even really seeing where the goalkeeper is. That's just knowing exactly where the goal is on a, on a snapshot on the turn. Uh, and then the second one, when the ball comes over from your boy Ralston, uh, which is a great great flight on it. And then he's managed to look at that. It's a very yeah. difficult skill to pull off hitting that on the volley when you're trying to keep your eye on the ball coming up over your head. And he made that look like child's play, um, to be honest. And then you get to the second half, and then as you rightly say, Jack Amakis comes on, scores an unbelievable overhead kick with pretty much his first involvement, uh, you know, in the game. Uh, yep. And then his second one, I think, is actually pretty much a Maeda ball, let's be honest. That is just He's watched too much of Maeda in training and thought, you know what, I fancy one of those shitty goals, I'll just get one of them on, on my record as well today. So um, between the two of them, you would think, if you put the two of them together... Uh, it, would, it could be absolutely unbelievable the, the sort of results you could get. You know, I, I, I know there's you know, obviously a lot of talk um, on social media and even indeed on the bus in terms of potentially, you know, playing Kyle Go in uh, the number 10 role. So we obviously now know that uh, Roger is no longer going to be a factor for us next season. And that does open up, you know, a position in there if you don't want to put O'Reilly in there every game, as that is a role I think Kyle Go um, could play if you don't want to put them both fully up front. Um, I do think they could both play fully up front together and I certainly would be um, very keen on seeing that, uh, seeing that in a like, you know, home game uh, in the league. Absolutely. I don't see why we are uh, so reserved to doing that at times. Uh, and, you know, if he was to end up putting the guys like Jack Gamakis and Kyogo up front, you'd bear in mind he could have guys like Jota still with us next season. Abada on the wings. You know, James Forrest has got a new deal. He could end up becoming back his best. You've also got guys like O'Reilly potentially in there behind them. Oh, the opportunities there for goals. It could be more than 10. We could be looking 11, 12, 13s in one game or so. <laughs> I'm absolutely convinced if he was to put the two of them up front with some of those wingers he's got, you're playing a team in the SPL, they could steamroll someone. Steamroll is a good word, Jonathan. I think you're absolutely right. But speaking of two players, Jonathan, there was a duo, not Kyogo and Jack Marcus, who represent the new era of Celtic for me. But two guys who leave the club, Jonathan, they represent the end of an era. 
a trophy laden, a real definition of trophy laden, by the way, um, is the careers in your beat on, and of course, the Wizard of Oz, Tom Rogic. Jonathan, it was hard not to feel emotional. Um, when they were leaving, I thought Nier Beaton's interview on Celtic TV was really classy. Uh, Tom Rogic in tears when he got subbed off. The amount of effort, all the players running towards him, cuddling for him. A lot of them, I've only worked with him for a year, by the way, including the likes of Joe Hart, who ran 40 yards to cuddle him. You know, and I just thought there's something really special, you know, about what Tom Rogic has done for Celtic. He's left a, I called it yesterday, a box of memories. That's what he's done, you know, it's it's a box of memories, Jonathan, that our go-to Celtic fans content, Jonathan, or Tom Rogic's goal reel, because they'll take you back to a trophy, they'll take you back to a huge, important moment in a league season, then it'll take you back to huge derby moments in a season as well. Um, I thought it was so classy of Celtic yesterday, Jonathan, letting them both carry the trophy out um, onto the pitch. Between that, the music that was playing over the PA, I don't know about you, but the Champions League music, Jonathan, had me in goosebumps all over. No exaggeration, because I don't like to kid on. There's loads going on upstairs with me, Jonathan, all the times. But I generally started going, fucking, I'm, oh my God, I'm picturing it now. You know, I thought it was a great move. Celtic just feel like they're connecting again with the fan base, Jonathan. They're playing ball a bit. They're playing all the fan songs that came been came up by the by the fans. The Jota song, the Leila Badr and Kyogo running yeah, hands and hands going up to the Green Brigade, <laughs> stuff like that. But that's because the PA system is dictating that as well. Mm -hmm. Celtic feel like they're trying to make an effort, Jonathan, to appeal to the fan base again. Albeit they should have played role with it, and it's still, you know, that still rankles with me a wee bit. But I do believe even the throwback to yesteryear by playing the Daft Punk one more time. It's a, you know, there's signs that Jonathan Celtic are be beginning to connect again. All is one. The Holy Trinity, Mister Rogers spoke of Jonathan. It feels like we're getting closer and closer to coming back to that, doesn't it? It certainly does, and um, I think that uh, you know you look at everything about uh, Sunday. There was just nothing, nothing that you could really say a bad word against from the whole club. Really, they've pretty much done that as brilliantly as they possibly could. I think they, it sounds similar. Like the initial intention was to bring Brown in to uh, to do the uh, the sort of trophy presentation, if you like. I believe he didn't want to get in the way of uh, Callum McGregor's moment, which is fair enough. Um, and obviously he's just now taking a job down at, at Fleetwood um, but I couldn't think of a more fitting way um, for uh, Roger and Beaton who've both been here for you know nine and a half years to actually bow out um, I know everyone's got mixed opinions on Beaton as, as a footballer in terms of what he brought to the table but yep. you can't dispute the fact he did love the club I think that's certainly um, apparent if you've watched the uh, interviews with him you could tell he was pretty emotional even when he was warming up uh, on, the, uh, on the day of the game you know, you could just see with Beaton, he was he was finding it a pretty difficult one to actually was. leave leave the club. Um, and you know, he, he, he certainly had good moments as well as bad. I know he obviously got he got a bit of a back and forth last week when we were talking about his bad moments. But there's absolutely no doubt Beaton was a, a very loyal servant for a lot a, a long long time um, with the club, and um, he'll rightly be remembered for that and thanked for that as well. Um, obviously, you're going on to Tom Rogic, uh, and that one seemed to come a little bit more out of nowhere. Beaton kind of felt like his time was up at Celtic, really, even before it was announced. It didn't, it didn't come as a big surprise to me that he decided it was time to, to move on. Uh, with Rogic, you were kind of feeling he would hang around for a wee while with Ange being back in there. Um, obviously, you've touched upon it. The Rogic's had so many great moments you could pick, you know, from at least 10, 15 easily. Yeah. Huge moments in, in games. And everyone will have their own favourite Tom Rogic moment. And there's so many to choose from. Uh, you could easily write up a, a Tom Rogic best of uh, DVD and it would sell instantly uh, with how much uh, joy he's brought to the club over the years. And I never really had Rogic down as being somebody who would get overly emotional, um, to be honest. But you see him coming off, it was hard uh, not to get a little bit misty-eyed when you see all the players going towards him. Uh, when you see the fact that all the players are, are giving him a cuddle, I think Postacoglu was almost like a father figure for him at the end to make sure he was still looked after. Disappointing thing for Roger, I guess, was the only fact he didn't get a goal to kind of cap his final day. It's the post he gets very close. But... What Tom Rogic will have as a consolation prize is he was my knockout of the week this week because for what Tom Rogic brought to this football club over the last uh, decade, 
is quite simply unsurpassed in this era of the last 10 years if you're looking at Celtic Football Club Tom Rogic is one of the names that is going to be synonymous with this era of Celtic Football Club Correct. It's going to be synonymous with championships synonymous with trebles synonymous with superb goals Tom Rogic and you know I think the fact the fans were getting emotional when they see him leaving the pitch and you could tell there was a few uh, few tears in the, the people's yeah. eyes and the crowds and everything else. For me, Tom Rogic, for his service rather than his performance, is my knockout of the week this week. I like that, Jonathan. That is a knockout of the week. Tom Rogic, Nero Beaton, they both leave with all our best wishes, Jonathan. I just thought it was wonderful that Celtic acknowledged not just that, but then got a family spirit, Jonathan, at the end of the game as well. Did you notice that? I just thought all the family being on, you know, Matt O'Reilly, too young to have a wife and kids, so it's just his <laughs> folks. He's with his folks and that. And I'm just like, this is brilliant. You just look at the whole, the whole pitch is full of families. And we were laughing Yesterday, Big Ange never stops, Jonathan, a six and an eight-year-old. Not bad, big man. I like your style, <laughs> mate. <laughs> He's still got it. He's still got it, eh? Plenty of juice left with Big Ange, which is good, because <laughs> that's a good thing, mate. Uh, I thought Celtic are trying to unite the, the, the fan base again, Jonathan. I thought through this season, they nearly fucked it all up again with the Bernard Higgins moment. And yeah. you're going, you know, you know. Remember, we were at the game, Jonathan Livingston, tennis balls on the drew nil nil. You mm-hmm. know, that's not that's all down to the board, not the fans. Half an the hour fans. silence before the uh, first half an hour as well. Remember, half an hour, yeah, yeah, yeah. Half an hour silence, exactly. That all went against Post to but it was not because of the fans are the problem. I think Andrew's very, very clever at that point in time as well. Where he says, you know, fans have the right to protest anything they don't like in any way they want. That's how he described that at the time, rather than saying, oh, we need them to kind of be on our side. No, no, no. He never said that. He actually respected their freedom, right? They've paid their ticket money, I think he reminded us as well. So it's up to them. Um, you look back at that, that was something, again, that could have came back and bit. But what I don't want to do is turn this into a negative at the board. I do genuinely think, as the season's progressed, progressed, and don't get me wrong, winning titles helps. Because they're all fucking money-driven bastards, Jonathan. But, either way, let's get everyone back on side and pulling in the same direction. And that is all down to Postacoglu and this team. And right now, Jonathan, I think the clubs are on the brink now. And it's up to them if they want to sink or swim, by the way. It's up to them if they want to go back to the shallow end or they want to be able to hang, swim in the deep end, Jonathan, with the rest of the big boys. Celtic's got the potential to do so. This isn't me going... Going Looney Tunes, Jonathan. We look at our rivals. They're in a European final right now. And I'll mention it again because it's relevant. It's happened in a couple of days. Doff the cap at their achievements in Europe because they've done it the right way. This this run they've made to the Europa League final has been done in a style that was not the same as the 2008 one, but I didn't really respect that run as much as I respected the manager, Walter Smith. The football's fucking awful. This time they've beat teams, fair dues, fair and square, by playing pretty entertaining way. Celtic should be more than capable of, of making such inroads in Europe, Jonathan, next year. We've got the right guy in charge. We've got a lot of the right players already. We've got a board that seemed to be, our PA team, that seemed to be, even the Twitter from Celtic, rather than just saying happy birthday every day to a former player, seems to be really on point with their messages, Jonathan, and exciting as always a fan base as well, making us laugh at times. The content on the social media has got better. The PA system, the interaction with the fan base yesterday, whether it be the songs that were played, whether it be uh, even like, I wonder even if, if Celtic maybe told Sky don't have Boyd down on trophy day, I've got a feeling they might have, Jonathan. Yeah. I don't think, I, I, I'm not convinced Sky Sports coverage has lent me to think there's been enough savvy from their point of view or who to bring on as a pundit at times, the amount of times Chris Boyd's been sat in the Celtic Park media room. I wonder if Celtic have done, have done a gentle, polite request, not for it to be Chris Boyd. I love to see former managers, Jonathan, you, uh, former manager uniting with the current manager. Uh, yeah, but Jonathan, it was brilliant because it brings them all together. And when you what, say his name, Russell, come on then, say his but name. But Martin O'Neill was Jonathan doing the Sky Sports coverage on the pitch. And as he's talking, Ange Postacoglu's kind of came from behind as if Martin O'Neill didn't know. O'Neill was savvy. He knew. He knew exactly what he said. Oh, he's done wonderful and he's done a fantastic job. 
And, oh, I never seen you there. And oh, Neil knew he was there. And, oh, Ange Postacoglu says, Jonathan, this, the great man, the great man. The great man. I love this sort of content, Jonathan. It just feels right now, everything's clicking into gear on so many different levels. The team are united. You know, the manager is the father figure of all everything that's happened. He's overseen it all. But the players seem really invested in the team, Jonathan. The only guy, as you touched on, is Julian, who looks like he's checked out. But... I know he did some sort of interview in France. I actually agree with what he said, though. I think it is really strange yeah, like how, little, how little he's been used, considering he's been fully fit since January. And I do think there's been a forcing him out going on, which, again, this is what I go back to what I was saying yesterday as well. And just a colder side to him, Jonathan, than what any of us want to accept or admit, because he's so warm and cuddly. Trust me, you don't get to the top, Jonathan, if you're all just nice all the time and warm. He's made a cold decision to force out a high earner. He's obviously looked at the wages Julian's on, looked at what he's bringing to the table, looked how long he's been out and went, I'll probably get a better version of you and you're taking up a lot of the wage room. No offence, but I'm going to need to squeeze you out. Do you know what I mean? Because of course Julian doesn't want to leave, but probably his most handsome contract of his career. He's 29 years old. Um, but I did actually agree with, like, if he's been fully fit since January, I am shocked there's not been ways we could have played them more during the season. Of course there was. So it tells you they're trying uh, They're trying to get back. Chris Kerr, another guy who's featured in the Boyd bus a few times. Brilliant yeah. to hear you. I hope all's well with you as well, Chris, mate. And thank you for tuning in and sending us a wee message. But yeah, Jonathan, I think with the Julian thing, it's just another example of ruthless Ange, not the father figure Ange. I think he needs to have that streak. Now, Martin O'Neill right now seems to be doing no but like I'm talking about like they're meeting and it's all really lovey dovey and he's talking all night to that like he was as cold as they came Jonathan when it came to getting a player out I didn't think twice about it Jonathan Mark Viduka the second man and he was first thing but Mark Viduka was unbelievable by the way footballer see you mm -hmm. later mate see you later and if you think you're a prick wait till you see me saying Chris Sutton next <laughs> 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 it didn't bother him because he knew how to manage them I think with the, the Julian Absence, and I know apparently Chris Sutton's done a tweet. Shall we try and find it for some content before we go, Jonathan? Apparently he's having a laugh at the behaviour thing, judging by the comments coming in. Let's have a wee look. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm sure Sutton will have come out with something, uh, something very boisterous. I'm sure he's he's on point. He usually is, Christopher. <laughs> he's wearing the Seville shirt, Jonathan. <laughs> oh fuck it, can I share this? Oh, who cares? I'm sharing it. Right, I'll just share it. Who cares? What can they do? Well, I'm sure I'm sure Sutton won't mind a little bit extra publicity. <laughs> He's welcome on the bus. Yeah, it's Sutton. Need him on the double down quiz over the summer, right. surely. Let's get this full bung. Hello there to all the Rangers fans out there in Seville. I'm just uh, following on with the messages from Graham Souness and Ian Durand and Richard Goff. Please just behave out in Seville and Try not to let yourselves down, okay? Come on, do the right thing, guys. <laughs> be good and behave and don't do anything naughty out there, okay? <laughs> in, <laughs> in the Seville shot, Jonathan. Oh, oh, I, mean, I mean, you talk about dreams in life, Jonathan. That would be the dream would be to have Sutton on the bus. I mean, that is just... It's even his face as he's doing it. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, that was oh. excellent. I think on that note, Jonathan, we'll leave it with some wise words from the same man, Chris Sutton, talking about a certain... What was it? What was it? A PJ... No, sorry, BFDJ. Sorry, I get my, I get, I get my letters confused sometimes, Jonathan. <laughs> BFD, FG, the PJD. Oh, I don't know, Jonathan. I get confused with letters. Anyway, have a lovely evening, guys. Thanks to everyone who's watched Feed the Bear, a moment in history, what you did tonight as well. Thank you so much to each and every one of you, viewers, passengers, contributors, members. We love you all. Good night, Glasgow Celtic champions again. Some of his comments about me deliberately trying to, to cause contra controversy. Well, I work in the media now. And you've got someone sitting there next to you who's an embarrassment to the media profession. He's an apologist. He's a charlatan. <laughs>